stadium. That's a lot of people looking at you, but this is the closest I might ever get to feeling like a rock star. Could you guys indulge me for five seconds and just give me everything you got? Just scream. <laughs> smells like an actual tomato again and you notice that it's hard to find things that smell like tomatoes so I'm standing there and I'm wearing shorts because it's summertime and I forget that when I'm wearing shorts I don't look like everyone else because on that day I had on what my two younger brothers affectionately refer to as my Robocop legs which means that they um, they don't resemble a human leg as much as they do a robot with black woven carbon fiber and shock absorbers in the spring and you know it looks pretty cool guys dig it of it. And I hear this voice behind me saying, well, if it isn't Amy Mullins. <laughs> and I turn around and I see this guy that looks frighteningly like Santa Claus. And I'm like, Santa, you've got my letters all this time. I have no idea who this man is. And I have a pretty good memory. And I said to him, I'm, I'm sorry, have we met? Hey, I don't remember meeting you. He said, well, you wouldn't remember meeting me because when we met, I was delivering you from your mother's womb. <laughs> Ew, put the potatoes down. <laughs> but of course it did, it all clicked who this guy was. I was like, you're Dr. Keene. It was a man that I'd only known from my mother's stories about that day. Because, you know, I arrived fashionably late for my own birthday by a few weeks, and my mother's prenatal physician had gone on vacation. So the guy that ended up having to deliver me was a complete stranger to my parents. And I was born missing the fibula bones. You reach out and knock on your shin. And one on the front is the tibia, and one on the side is the fibula. I didn't have that. The feet weren't fully formed. There were a couple toes on either foot. They didn't know what else issues they were going to be facing. And this complete stranger had to be the bearer of bad news to my parents. I was their first child. And we're standing there in, in, in this food supermarket, and he tells me, I was the one who had to give the prognosis to your parents that you would never walk, you'd never run, you'd never have any kind of independent mobility like any other kid. And you've been making a liar out of me ever since, so thanks. <laughs> and then making the United States team 20 years ago for the 96 Atlanta game. I haven't changed. Um, and he collated it into this, this part of his class that he was teaching at Hahnemann Medical School in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And he called this part of his class the X Factor. And he was reminding his young doctors that no prognosis can ever account for how powerful human will can be as determinant of the quality of someone's life. <laughs> For much of my childhood, I was consistently being told by experts what I would never be able to do or never be able to be. They'd be like, this pair of legs is gonna take you five months to learn to walk. And I knew I'd have it down in hours. I knew they were wrong, because I could feel the power in my own body. So Dr. Keene and I learned the same 
important lesson, albeit in our own different ways, which was that the experts don't always know. And I had firsthand experience that they were wrong time and time again, so it became kind of a baseline for me to fundamentally reject any limit that someone else was trying to place on my potential. And like many children, yes, I had a genetic stubbornness, probably wouldn't take no for an answer, and uh, yet the stakes were higher for me. I couldn't take no for an answer. I had to have the determination and the, the persistence of will in order to create the possibilities I wanted to see within my own life. Because all these experts kept setting the bar so low for me. So don't let others determine your potential. You have to claim your own power over it, and you have to keep doing that throughout your whole life. I mean, how many people around us, even when they have the best intentions, tell us what they think we're capable of? You need to decide what you're capable of. That's what your willpower is for. And those of you who have toddlers know what I'm talking about in regards to the incredible willpower innate in a child. A child doesn't focus on the obstacles. When they're trying to learn to walk, they keep falling down. You never just say, well, that's it. I guess you're going to stay on the floor. You know? They are convinced of the inevitability of their success. Nothing seems impossible to a child. They just haven't figured out how to solve their problem yet. So let's never stop thinking like a child. What does this mean? It's using your curiosity to find new ways to get where you want to go. You know, it's why we crawl before we walk. We know we want to go, and we just keep figuring out new ways to get there. This curiosity is innate. We are all born with it. A couple of years ago, I found myself <laughs> saying yes to speaking at a children's museum in Boston for, I know, woo, Boston, one per, I love it. There's like seven people for Allentown and one person for Boston. What happened to you? Where'd your homies go? Anyway, Boston Children's Museum, it's a great place if you're ever in Boston, you should check it out. And this was 300 six to eight year olds. Now this is the most terrifying audience ever, people. Anyone under eight and over 80, for the same reason. <laughs> there is no edit button. They say exactly what they're thinking, when they're thinking it. And they're usually right. So <laughs> I was like, what am I gonna do with this audience? I thought, show and tell, show and tell, I got it. So I bring with me a big bag of legs. Like, just every leg I could find. I was like, just get it, throw in a bag, sports legs, silicon legs, you know, show and tell. So I get this table, I put these legs out on this table, and, you know, I know from experience, kids are naturally curious. We are about whatever we don't know and understand. They want to know. They want to find out. They only learn to be afraid of what they don't know or to rein in that natural curiosity or the question asking when an adult influences them to behave that way. And so sure enough, you know, these kids are out being held in the lobby by these frazzled first grade teachers, and I heard the one woman say, children, children, please, when we go in there, what are we going to do? Please don't stare at her legs. <laughs> and I was like, that's the point. That's why I came. I wanted to invite them to look and touch and explore. So I went out there and I made a deal with the adults. I said, look, can you just give me the kids on their own, two minutes, no adults, let them come into the room. And they agreed. So the doors open, these kids come in, descend on this table, and they are poking and prodding and they're tickling my, you know, they're holding a leg 20 feet from me and tickling the toes, trying to be like, <laughs> you know, they're smelling it, like, ooh, is that stinky? Like, you know, just kids. And I said, kids, kids, really quickly, we don't have much time for this dream workshop, but I woke up this morning and I decided I wanted to be able to jump over a house. Nothing too tall, but Two stories, maybe three, if you want to be extravagant. If you can think right now, any animal, any superhero, any cartoon character, anyone you can think of right now, what kind of legs would you build me? And immediately, some kid goes, kangaroo! Someone said, no, it should be a frog. Someone said, no, it should be go, go, catch it. Someone's like, no, it should be from The Incredibles. And then it, they got into like Japanese anime that I wasn't even familiar with yet. And 
Then one eight-year-old boy goes, no, wait, wait, wait. Why would you just want to jump? Why wouldn't you want to fly? And all the kids went, yeah. And I was like, yeah. Yeah, I want to fly. I'm going to be limiting myself at jumping over a house. But just like that, in under two minutes, I went from being a woman that these kids would have been trained to see as disabled, as less able than them. And then I went to a person who had more potential in her body than they had, someone who might even be super able to. It was fascinating to me. Those are so nice. I'm coming back next week. <laughs> but sadly, we know this. We tend to stop using our curiosity as we get older. You know, we get into the teenage years, like, mm, it's not cool. And it just kind of goes down from there. And that's not really a good thing, you know? It's not good to get set in our ways. We get sick. <coughs> so, as adults, we need to cultivate the habit of being curious. We need to practice our curiosity like it's a sport. It should be as important to your daily health as brushing your teeth and taking your vitamins. Practice your curiosity. It was curiosity that brought me to the idea of disabled sports. I mean, when I was a kid, <laughs> my, my brother is like a finance guy now. He has no idea that so many people have seen him in his diaper. <laughs> you see those wooden legs. That's what I had. I had wooden legs. I had the big Velcro strap around the thigh. And I had never met another amputee my entire childhood. You know, and I had these wooden legs in second grade music class, you know, we had to do, basically, the summer before, I'm at a family picnic and I walk through a, an ongoing bocce ball game. Whack. It's great, isn't it? It's great. What I didn't realize is there was a hairline crack in the wooden leg. Um, and <laughs> you're actually not supposed to go swimming with wooden legs for obvious reasons, but you try and tell that to a five-year-old whose neighbor has an in-ground pool. So I've got rusty bolts holding the, the foot part onto the wooden shin bar, and I've got a crack that I don't know about. And I'm in music class in second grade, and we, she puts the record on, and we have to do the twist, and I hear this <laughs> Next thing I know, I'm on the floor, and like my legs and splinters, and the foot fits over here, and I'm over here, and, and kids are screaming, and the teacher faints on the piano. <laughs> I remember the, like being taken down to the nurse's office and someone's arms freaking out going, my parents were gonna kill me! I broke my leg, insurance is not gonna replace it. And then, you know, when legs, when, when, when I'm eight, my prosthetist calls and he's like, Amy, it's great, no more rusty bolts, no more cracking wooden legs. We got you swim legs, the polypropylene. I mean, this is like gonna be the life-changing thing for me. Until I see them and they're, the, the white plastic milk jug carton material. I, I mean, I don't mean white girl, I mean white. <laughs> and they're so good at being waterproof that they're buoyant. <laughs> they got this foot on them, a rubberized unisex foot that is a nuclear shade of peach. There's no human being with this skin tone. <laughs> so there I am at the local public pool, going off the high dives, coming down, coming back straight up. <laughs> <laughs> And these legs, though, even these legs, turned out to save my life one time. I was at the Jersey Shore, and this is totally where I know I got my sprinting skills, because by the time my family got there, there's like 300 rows of blankets between you and the sea. So I was like the white flash. I was like, just get as fast as you can into the water. And I was a good swimmer. But I'm sorry, no amount of swimming ability can help you with buoyant legs in a saline body of water. So I'm out there, and I'm out there, and my, now I have two younger brothers who are probably forcing each other to eat sand. My parents are more concerned about the boys. And I get taken into this current, and I didn't know at that age not to swim against the current. So I get exhausted, and I felt myself starting to take in water. And all I could think to do was pop off either leg, put them under either armpit with the peach thing, this is like the beacon device, and just wait till somebody saw me, and this poor lifeguard that found me in his... I'm always, I'm like, I'm sure 
him to get a therapy bill one day from this guy. Like, no, oh, no one ever showed that on Baywatch. No one ever showed that. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't know anything else. So it's like, this is, this is what you do. And with those wooden legs, I played sports alongside kids who had flesh and bone legs. And I played every sport. I, I swam, I skied, I played soccer, I played volleyball, I played softball. And I learned not to overlook the advantages of being different. Like when you have wooden legs and you want to steal second base, and the girl covering the bag can decide whether she wants to take that wooden leg into her shin or get out of the way. Had the stolen bases record one year. Anyway, I had never met another um, amputee, right? And it never, I'd never even heard of disabled sports. And it wasn't until I was at college where some guy said to me, you know, you should run this track meet that's coming up in Boston, it's, you know, with other people like you. And I was like, other people like me? Lawns? He's like, you know, it's a disabled track meet, people in wheelchairs and stuff. It'll be uplifting. I was like, uplifting? I'm imagining his assemblage of Helen Keller, me, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, Pollyanna, and the ghost of Tiny Tim that attract me. <coughs> Feel good event of the year. I was like, thanks, but no thanks. I don't I, I saw myself as a competitor. I didn't need a self-esteem boost. And I went home that night, and I was so aggravated by this guy. I was like, what did what other people like me? And I thought, I actually don't know what this disabled sports is. I have no idea what he's talking about. And I realized I was, this anger was coming from arrogance. And my ignorance about what disabled sports was was fueling my arrogance. So I knew that I needed to go check it out firsthand because I was, exper I was judging something without experiencing it. So I signed up for this race. I signed up for the, it was the smallest amount of running you had to do, which was 100 meters. Never mind that I'd never run track before, and this was the National Disabled Sports Championships. Jump in the deep end, you know? I go up for my training <laughs> to this gravel track in Washington up behind American University in Tenleytown, and there's this lone woman. It's a very, a gravel track, people. It's a very sad place. And she's jogging around, and I, I, I asked her, I said, how, how what part of the track is the 100 meters? Because you know people, Americans, we technically learn the metric system. What, do you really know what that means, 100 meters? So she's like, it's the straightaway part of the track. I'm like, oh, okay, I can do that. So I set myself at one end, just run like, you know, the wind, and collapse into a pile at 55 meters. It's so much farther than you think it is. And, you know, I learned that day why so many athletes really hate running without a ball. Um, there's nothing to take your mind off of how much your body's hurting. It's like, why would you do that? And yet, I went back another few times before this Boston meet, and I had never made it past 60 meters. So I was like, okay, strategy. My big plan was that I was going to deprive myself of caffeine for the week before the meet. And then the morning of my race, I was gonna go to Starbucks, get a huge cup of joe, which was gonna act like rocket fuel, and make me super fast. <laughs> Teenager. So this is what I do. I board this plane to Boston, I get off, I go to Starbucks, I go to MIT's campus, and what I see, as I'm standing there in my wooden legs, my new little running shoes, is stuff that looks like it came out of NASA's research lab. It's woven carbon fiber, it's a shock absorber and a spring. Basically those Robocop legs that I've been telling you guys about before. So I didn't get those till later. This is me still at wooden leg stage. And they're all looking at me like, no, you're from Allentown, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, oh, cute. People, this is before Google. This is before you could just type into a search engine prosthetic and come up with you know, millions of images. Like, I didn't know what other people had. So they're looking at me like I'm this baby frozen woolly mammoth found in a block of ice. Like, don't you? Peg like Pete, so cute. And 
I'm like, oh no, what did I get myself into? Ah, it's 10 minutes before my race. I find the track official and I'm like, look, and of course my coffee plan is backfiring. I totally got the shakes. I'm like a crazy person. I'm like, you need tips, any tricks, any tips or tricks, anything I should know if it's 100 meters, anything, 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 anything. And he's like, now? You want now? Well, okay. Uh, I guess what I could tell you is this. If you cross the finish line and you have anything left, you didn't run hard enough. Okay, so with that being the sole idea I could hold on to in my mind, I get on the starting line, gun goes off, I ran like something big and hairy was chasing me down this track. I mean, I ran for my life and I threw myself, I'm not even kidding, threw myself, launched over the finish line, beating the woman who was the then national record holder in the 100 meter by six hundredths of a second. My it's full, full admission, people. Some, a few years later, someone showed me a photograph of that meet, and I saw evidence of exactly why I had won. When I say that something big and hairy was chasing me in my mind, my teeth were bared, my fists were clenched, my arms were flying like this. And the girls on the other side of me were like, oh, trying not to get punched rather than figuring out how to run their race. But I didn't know that then. So I'm laying there on the ground, barely you know, being able to breathe, but the new national record holder in the 100 meter, my first time out. So the peacock tail's like starting to I'm like, this is amazing. What else can I do that I didn't know I could do? And then, just then, the heat sheet for the men's long jump was posted, which was going to happen that afternoon. And I went to the track guide and I said, well, what time is the women's long jump? He said, there is no women's long jump. Oh, yeah, why not? And he went, well, because no women have signed up. I'm like, this is fantastic. I, I'm going to go home with two first place. Put me out. Three jumps. So eight men jump, and I jump, and eight men jump, and I jump. And somewhere between the second and third jump, this guy comes up to me, and he's wearing this big baggy track suit, so I have no idea what NASA technology he's got going on in his body and where. And he says, hey, Amy, I hear you're a, double, you're a double BK. I'm like, is that a hamburger? <laughs> I, I'm no, the lingo of this whole world, I have no idea. He's like, it's a double below the knee amputee. That's what you are. That's what I am. You're doing the long jump. How, how are you doing that? I said, well, you know, it's, it's kind of self-explanatory. Like from field, you know, you run down this runway, you try not to cross that white line, and you, and you hope your butt hits the sand because it's really bad at doesn't. And he's like, yeah, I understand how the long jump is done, but we are not supposed to be able to do the long jump because we don't have a good foot to push off of. Sure enough, I look at the other eight guys, and they all have one flesh and bone leg, which they use for the springboard. And I was like, well, nobody told me that. I already jumped twice. I'm gonna... that day of the U.S. record, and within a year set the world record in the long jump, I took that to track me, still having been the only double BK, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, to, to even attempt it. So I was like, it was a revelation to me, like, my first clue into how disabling, as a verb, people can be to themselves, simply because they've accepted an ending before they ever got started. They didn't bother to explore it for themselves to see if they might be the one to do something different. They lost their curiosity. So not practicing your curiosity just keeps you in your comfort zone. And it makes you static. You don't grow. So get comfortable with being uncomfortable. What connects any champion What connects any champion to any other champion in any field around the world is this habitual trait. 
They understand that adversity is natural. It's coming, you can't prevent it. So they don't seize up when they face it. I mean, adversity is common to everyone, right? Is there a single person in this room who's never experienced adversity? All right, I'm still, still got the good over, over record going. Yet it's typical, even though we just all experience it, it's typical for most of us to think of it in these terms. Adversity equals discomfort, right? And for most people, discomfort is a setback. It's like, ooh. Whereas for champions, discomfort equals growth. It's why you have to change up your workout. Because when your muscles stop aching, you know you've stopped growing. Champions engage with the experience of being challenged rather than shrink away from it. So getting comfortable with being uncomfortable simply means that because champions practice their curiosity like it's a sport, and they know that curiosity is their secret weapon for the fastest problem solving, they've developed a habit of adapting quickly to change more quickly than most people. And that's a major advantage. It's how you're able to ride the waves, pivot, instead of getting bowled over. And yes, sometimes we do get bowled over. We, we can, the unknown future with all its guaranteed challenges and adversity, we know that that's probably scary. That can be scary to us. I mean, I completely acknowledge that fear exists. I, I, I don't like when people use these platitudes about being fearless, because I think fear can be a great motivator. But we do also need to keep those fears at bay because most of our fears tend to come from a little voice that's our ego. Putting our egos aside, like recognizing when it's your ego driving you and not a genuine curiosity to experience something, to try something out. Putting your ego aside allows us to see opportunities to help others pull out the best in themselves. Right? It's that Ability to be compassionate for someone's fear and, and anxiety about adversity, coupled with the necessary ability to give that a kick in the butt. I experienced that quality firsthand from working with my college track coach, Frank Gagliano, especially known as uh, Coach Gags. Coach Gags is a living legend in the track world. He's in his 70s now, he's still doing it. He has coached scores of All-Americans, world champions, and Olympians, obviously at the top level of the sport. And, you know, he's this robust man who hails originally from Brooklyn. He hasn't lost the accent or the attitude. And I came to him shortly after that Boston track meet, still as much a novice to the language and the, and the training structure of, of being a track athlete as I was before I became the national record holder in the 100 meter race, right? So I knew like, I was gonna have to completely overhaul, transform myself in order to make the United States team. I was gonna have to do that and, and become a technically astute sprinter, but also I knew I was gonna have to abandon the lifelong companion of those wooden legs. And I was gonna have to trade up and get those Robocop legs that everyone was running on in Boston. But, I didn't get those legs just yet. What happened for me was that I arrived at precisely the right moment to be the guinea pig for an entirely new design of a leg. See, it's super rare to be a, a bilateral amputee, a double, double amputee. It's really rare. On the, on, the, on the totem pole hierarchy of amputees, we're at the bottom. Most amputees have one flesh and bone leg or arm if it's an arm amputee and the prosthetist who makes the leg just you know his whole aim is to replace any semblance of a human leg no matter how limited or mediocre it's like shin foot and when you have one flesh and bone leg they just model the prosthetic off of the other leg so your height your weight your alignment the pronation the feet it's all determined already but for me we don't know how tall I would actually be. We can guess, but it's still within a number of inches, which is a lot if you think about it when you're talking about stride length and things like this. 
So no one was considering, during this whole childhood, I was just a headache for, for these prophetess, no one was considering what we could do, what we could create in the negative space between where my leg ended and the ground. I mean, that's that much space. So this adversity I presented, I presented to a prophetess was an opportunity for an inventor who had no idea what a leg should look like and no history of baggage about what a prosthetic leg should do. And the rather childlike idea was this. If I'm trying to be the fastest woman in the world on prosthetic legs and I don't have to have human legs, then why aren't we looking at them? Why aren't we looking at the fastest thing that runs? Which is what? A cheetah. These are the prototype of legs that I think by now you've all seen, right? But 20 years ago, nobody had seen these things. And, you know, this, you can see here on the bottom, there's a spike plate. We ripped the spike plate off of the track shoe and we bonded it directly onto the woven carbon fiber. You know, woven carbon fiber, lightweight energy storing material, and that shape, not only the hind leg of a, of a cheetah, is basically, puts you up like a sprinter on the ball of your foot, right? So when I would get those legs, my hamstrings and gluteals contract, and it feels like I'm up on, on my tippy toes, and I, and I need to get moving because you, there's no stability. You can't just kind of stand and hang out in those legs. They're made for sprinting. And there was a silicone sleeve that would roll up over my knee onto the side, that you can see there, it's a clear one, and a one-way vacuum pump valve on the back of that socket. So. Every time I would step down into the socket, any air that's remaining in the socket would be forced out and not allowed back in, thereby creating a suction socket. So the idea is, you should be able to pull me across the, drag me across the room by the leg before you get it off me. Now, it took me a whole month to actually learn and develop the strength and the balance, the core balance, to be able to, to run 100 meters on them. But once I did, my time quickly dropped. And I knew, you know, I had joined Georgetown's nationally ranked Division I track team, um, and I was going out on Saturday mornings and being timed as part of the USA Track and Field, and I was all set to have a personal best at this meet that you'll see here. It was the Big East Championship. You know, this, you can see, I was like running against the next slow joes. But, and everybody by this point, word had gotten out. There's a girl running for Georgetown with these funky legs. So there's TV cameras there, 5,000 people in the stands, you know, reporters. I'm just trying to make it all go away. I'm just like I'm trying, to, trying, to, trying to deal with what I had to do. And truthfully, every Tuesday, I would start to get nauseous. By Thursday, I was losing sleep. All day Friday, I was going to tell Coach Gags that I needed to quit. And then Saturday, I'd be shaking before my race. Upon which, after having done it, filled me with such euphoria, I wanted to do it all over again, right away, and that euphoria would last till the next Tuesday, when the cycle would start again. But, you know, when you're going for something big in your dream, you have to play against people who are better than you at first so that you can learn. So we didn't know, because I was the guinea pig on these, like, we didn't know what was going to happen in certain conditions, like heat, for instance. So, this is a hot, hot day in Philadelphia, and I'm warming up, I'm doing my drills, I'm, you know, sweating inside the socket. And the sweat is moving up and up and up and up and up through the silicon sleeve into the thigh. It's acting like a lubricant. I'm starting a piston in the socket. This, the gun goes off, this is 100 meters, and 80 meters in, I fill up on my right leg, and I go down. Now, I didn't come completely out of my leg, but damage was done. I don't know what your worst nightmare is, but this was mine. Being in public without my legs on. There was no more vulnerability that I could possibly feel than this. And I, I quickly like managed to kind of get across the, the finish line so that the time was recorded. But I picked myself up and you know went over to my coach who gets his own section of the stands because he paces and he makes everyone nervous. And he looked at me and I'm scraped up. I, I took, I, I bit the track pretty hard and I didn't feel any of that. 
because it was my ego that was the most bruised, you know? And he looked at me and said, you okay, kid? I said, yeah, 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 I'm fine. You know, employing the same stiff upper lip thing that I've been doing to train every week with everyone staring at me, to compete every week with everyone staring at me. I mean, I was a teenage girl that went from trying to just be normal to realizing you can't afford to be normal when you're trying to do something extraordinary and inviting people to stare at me. So when he said, you know, you okay? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, good, stay loose because the 200 is coming up in uh, 20 minutes. <laughs> Sorry, what? 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 He's like, yeah, you gotta do the deuce. And I went, um, okay, did you see that? What happened? My leg came off. My leg came off. It, it, if it didn't stay on for 100 meters in this heat, it's not gonna stay on for 200 meters. And he ignored me. And panic sets in. Like, what, what, I realized he had no idea. He had no idea what I went through every week training for this and trying to make the United States team. He had, he had no clue what it was like to be the first person in the world on these legs and have everybody just, you know, looking at you like a, some kind of an object, like an insect or something, you know, a new discovery. And I, so I started to beg. I mean, I got hysterical. Tears are streaming down my face at this point. I dropped to my knees, I'm like, gag, don't you understand? My leg is going to fall off. It's going to come off. I'm going to be here. The leg's going to be there. People are going to be pointing and screaming and fainting. And he went, so what? So what if your leg falls off? You pick it up. You put it on. You finish the gosh darn race. Now get out there and run the deuce. <laughs> he didn't use gosh darn. And suddenly when I realized whatever he was going to do to me, if I didn't run this race, it was going to be so much worse than whatever suffering at the hands of like 5,000 strangers. And it was a great gift he gave me. So what? So often, we don't want to look at our worst fear, our worst nightmare, because it's our egos and all the fears that live within them that are really what's holding us back from crossing the threshold of true strength, true growth, and true success. It's our ego that hides our full ability from ourselves because our egos only ever want to know about our strengths, the pretty stuff, not our weaknesses and the stuff that makes us scared. But there is an important partnership between what we might perceive as our deficiencies and where our greatest creative and problem-solving ability comes from. The fact that your body and your mind don't work exactly like everyone else's is an asset. So value your challenges. Value your ability to adapt to them quickly by using curiosity. And value what makes you different because that's what's gonna afford you your very own unique perspective. And what others will still see as adversity, we will know to be opportunity. And that is the true power of any champion. Thanks, guys.